So yeah, hello everyone. This is we'll discuss today chapter ten, which is dynamic UI, and we will dive deeper into how building a dynamic UI in Shiny. Um, our learning objectives is learn how to add dynamics to our Shiny apps to be able to see interactive changes, uh, to potentially automate command function for com more complex visualization. And at the end of the chapter, you will be able to understand what is dynamic user interface and what are the functions to update, hide, or make it visible and render changes made, uh, render, uh, render the changes uh, made interactively for, from, the, from the UI to the server output. Um, so yeah, we will talk just about this kind of updating inputs using update inputs functions. Um, we talked about um, updating input, yeah, like input updating up an output, and that's what we all do now, right now for, for our Shiny apps. And the new thing is we using an, a particular set of functions to update the inputs themselves um, to trigger like a reactive, um function or a, or a event reactive or 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 any reactive set of function um but we do it this automatically so we act as our uh, as the user of the app by using this function so this is how this is how he, he, to describe it and that's that's what he said when when he said the, the, to potentially automate command uh, functions for more complex visualization We'll see that in the, when uh, when we go to through the chapters. Um, so yeah, let's begin. So introduction to chapter based on dynamic UI is made to addressing the user interface by updating the server outcome. Uh, there are three main sections, all of them related to automated functions, uh, able to dynamically change the output passing through parallel command between the UI and the server. So. Um, what is a dynamic user interface? How to create a user inter uh, dynamic user interface? One way to do this is changing the UI using code run in the server function and by modifying inputs and outputs to see dynamic changes in the app. So as, as we said, we already said that we just modifying uh, the inputs themselves and or, or the outputs, of course, but we already talked about how to how inputs defining outputs or how we modifying outputs with code based on inputs. That's that's what we talked about in the uh, in the latest chapters. But uh, the new thing where we control or automate the changes that happen to the input itself that will 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 trigger the reactive graph. Um, so yeah. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, so updating inputs. There are the key uh, techniques for creating dynamic user interfaces, where which is our update functions and tap set panel, UI outputs and render UI. So in this first part of the dynamic UI chapter, we will see how to pass from basic structure to a more complicated, what complicated one by adding dynamics to the outputs uh, to the output of that. Calling the updating functions, uh, as, as we know that the, the basic structure of Shiny app is made of a UI and the user like a user interface and a server. Um, so the first app is like this. Um, the update function allows you to modify the control after it has been created with a series of ID input and update ID input. So basically what it says is when um, when the input and the graph is being drawn inside um, inside shiny, um, every output after after it's created, after the, the input is created and or in, constructed as it said, um, in an object oriented way, thinking. Um, and then the output function is uh, finishing 
finished. After it's finished, now we could use this up, this set of function, which is update functions, to manipulate or change the input after it's created. So basically, we are controlling the constructed uh, the constructor of this this set of um, inputs uh, after it's created. It's been created. Um, yeah. So. Um, I think let's go to the book itself. I think it's uh, it's more elaborate. Uh, let's go to updating inputs. Okay. Yeah. So we have a couple of examples now. In this example, this particular one, we have a minimum and a maximum, and a slider. All of them have inputs. We're using an observe event to track the minimum and observe event to track the maximum. And we updating the slider based on the, of the minimum and the maximum of the uh, like the inputs that we have in the, in the UI. So we treat the slider input as, a, as our output. Um, so with, when we see this one, see? OK. So yeah, we have minimum is zero and maximum is three. We have this zero and three as here. When we treat, when we um, like change the minimum, it will change automatically here. And again, if we change a maximum, same. So basically we are triggering the changes, like building the, a graph that there was a dependency based on our inputs. Same as we do in with the outputs, but here we are controlling the inputs themselves. And we'll see why this is could be uh, dangerous uh, if you if are not careful um, afterward. Let's see. Okay. So yeah, we have a, a lot of example. This is simple use cases. Uh, of the out update function are to provide small conveniences. Uh, here we are updating. Yeah, let's see what this one as well. Okay. So yeah, same. We we could use it that way. We are like a reset button to reset all the values when we are changing it using these update functions. So we have five minus five and seven. And when we reset, it all becomes zero. That's it. Okay. Now, um, and the code here, we see that same. We just have a three update function for when was one or the event, observe event that depend on this input reset button. When we click it, we are resetting. So we are controlling the, the UI uh inputs using this kind of functions um so yeah and a um, similar one is simulate um yeah we could change uh, the input labels using this and here if you see this one <coughs> excuse me so yeah uh, we, when we change the here in the slider one, two, three. We changing the label itself when we are uh, changing the this input, uh, new, this numeric input. And this is actually so powerful that we could um, this do drawing these links between inputs. This is so powerful to to show what is the name of the the eighth chapter, user feedback. We could use this to to do this user feedback, um, or more dynamically user feed um, uh, con um, complex user feedback uh, using this kind of functionality. Um, yeah, and there are a lot of ways of doing that of creating this kind of stuff. So if you go if it goes to let's go to this one. Okay, put it here. 
Oh yeah, so, um, so there is a hierarchical and freezing and circular differences. Uh, other consideration need to be done when requesting the app update following the interactive request made by the user. The selection national hierarchy. Okay, I I don't see that um, a very uh, like verbose way of. Uh, okay, let's go to the hierarchical select boxes because this is interesting. This is really interesting. So it's um, we're creating a hierarchical dependency of inputs. So uh, actually, I, I think I have this in, in the R, R studio. Let's try to see it. OK, this one, and run. So, OK, now we have a territory and a customer. Now you see the, see the code. I think now you could see all the code now. Um, so yeah, we have a territory and the customer and the order number, three different set of inputs. Uh, so select three se different selects and we put this to unique, uh, this one is predefined for us and the others with null. So the choices is null. So it doesn't show anything. Now, we want to control the choices using this update function we, uh, and creating this kind of hierarchical view of dependence, dependent input. So when a, a territory change, do this stuff. So we see in this, uh, in this server function, we have a reactive, territory reactive, and it, what it does is simple. It, uh, it just filter based on the territory that coming from the input, which is a select input, which is this one. So this is simple. This is a very simple one. Now the observe event is calling this territory reactive, and we said that okay, um, depend on this reactive function. So when this reactive function is triggered, do the other do the following. Um, create an, a choices um, variable and come get the unique territory customer name. And the customer name here is um, the, um, like it would return uh, the territory, um, the territory that the specific customer name column of this specific territory based on this filter function. So yeah, and we change that to the sources and we update the select one with the input UID. So yeah, we, 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 don't, we didn't like discuss the structure of the update function. So every update function has this kind of structure, which is input ID, which is the input, the ID of the input that we are targeting and the other arguments based on the the type of the input. So here we have a choices argument. You could like add other stuff. Uh, if you go to, let's try to have this. Okay. Yeah. So we have the input ID, a label, choices, and selected. This is our. These are the and if, of course the session and but we it, it takes the default value so. We don't we did we don't have to uh, to do it ourselves, but yeah. Uh, so the input is is fixed for I think all the uh, update functions, but the other stuff is changed based on the type of the uh, of the of the input itself. Um, so yeah, I hope that if uh, if you if anyone don't don't understand anything, please interrupt me and say it. Um, yeah. So updating a select input, all it takes is uh, the customer name, which is the input of ID, which is this one. And we give it as choices that we are filtered based on the territory, which is a reactive. Um, so yeah, we're creating a dependency using the reactive and the observe event. So we're observing any changes that happen to the reactive. Is the reactive is triggered and tri is how it's triggered by the user. 
So, um, uh, of course, at first it is triggered by, uh, uh, as de by default because uh, we are specifying as a, a unique, um, like a default one, a default value for it. So it will get triggered first time and stop. Then when we try it again, we'll, it will trigger again and again and again and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, that's that's how that's how when we change this, the territory have a, a different set of choices or customers or shift different customers for every territory. So when we change the territory, it changes the set of customers that we have um, in uh, in this drop down. So yeah, this is how you could create this very hierarchical uh, UI view uh, for our for our data to play with and make it like very dependent on one another um, and display it better, of course. Um, so yeah, this is this is the, this part, the first part, the second part is uh, we create a customer reactive, do, we doing the same thing basically, but here we are making making sure that is the customer name is uh, is uh, is being choose or is being uh, selected or even it's been like changed. So we require we require this to be valid, to be required uh, to be uh, like uh, like called. And then we doing the filtering as as before. Same here, same stuff, order number, but we we did this with the order number now. Um, change the customer name, uh, which is the order number based on the customer name and so on and so forth. So we see here this these are the orders that of, of the land of toys in, uh, in corporate uh, customer uh, for this territory, which is in A. Um, yeah. And finally, we just output uh, the table, which is normal. Um, but yeah, this is how we could create this hierarchical view of dependent inputs that the one depend on another and we don't we don't have this even a default value for it, for this tool so we are controlling them just by code and knowing how to use this reactive and observe event functions um yeah very interesting way of controlling the ui we'll see also how we could use it more uh, in the next chapters okay now let's go back to our, <coughs> excuse me. How, okay, yeah, I didn't see it like, yeah, let's go here. So there's a concept of freezing reactive inputs. Um, for example, let's call this app. So you see, um, get load and see. Okay, so in this, app we have a we had choose a data set itself and a column to see its summary so that's a simple app now what it shows it uh, it shows that uh, there is a some 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 something called like a flicker effect which is like something something like if we change the pressure to cars you see here it changes like it does us like a flicker or um, like a lag effect. And this is normal because uh, it waits, it should wait. Of course, as we are observing everything that gone, let's go, let's go to the code to understand it better. Um, we are, yeah, here, we are like uh, using this reactive to, see the, uh, the the input of the data set itself and we observe this input data set when it's changed okay so since we are triggering the update select input function here uh, it will only work let's go back uh, it will only work when the output is finished and the reactive is finished executing all of them are ex finished executing so 
when since the reactive and the observed event or the observed event itself it doesn't finish yet um and um uh, and the output itself it doesn't finish yet this flicker effect is happening which is we have we we're getting the uh, values that didn't yet come uh, uh, calculated so that's what we see i, I think we, that's what we see here uh if we change it you see that there is a less um lens and the what is it called glass which is something that uh, basically it says that there is no data we are not getting the data set yet um so yeah that's that's the flicker effect that happened uh when we ch when you change the uh when you change uh the or when we use like the the update selects input um like very rapidly in shining so yeah, it's advised in the book to use what is called the freezing uh function or what is called freezing uh yeah freeze reactive value to freeze anything that we want to update before we update it so to to avoid this flicker effect basically so it's best practice yeah it's best practice to use this freezing uh, uh freeze or reactive value before any update that you are uh you do uh on a on a select uh on, on, a, on an input in the UI um yeah i think that we have this in i don't remember let's see okay Let's see this. Yeah, I think this was. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so now we said using this freeze reactive value, we are we are saying basically just freeze this input before I update it. Just freeze it, and then I will update it, and then you could continue the execution. So freeze this value will take like, um, let's see if we'll, what it takes. So you can resolve this problem by freezing the input with this. This ensures that uh, any reactives or outputs that use the input uh, won't be updated until the next full round of invalidation. So basically it said, wait to the other round of invalidation, which is a process we'll talk about in when we talk about reactivity, okay? Um, but, uh, it's it's like it's like um, the full process of creating the reactive graphs that we talked about in the basic reactivity chapter. Um, so yeah, this is a process itself. It's called the the invalidation process. So um, we talk more about it in mastering reactivity. But yeah, so yeah, we are basically just make it wait to to the next round of the invalidation process. Um, yeah, and here it's called, it's, it says that always use it when you dynamically change an input value. Um, so use the freeze to tell the downstream calculations that the input value is stalled and they should save their effort until it's useful. Yeah, and now there is a circular references, which is like uh, one, something depend on another thing and it could like uh, this input when you change, we observe it and we update. Since we're updating, <clears throat> since we're updating it, it trigger again the, the observe event and so on and so forth and going into the infinite loop. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you are unlikely to create such an obvious problem in your app, um, in your own app, but it can crop out if you update multiple controls that depend on one another. So this is how it could be tricky uh, if you have multiple update functions that do uh, it, that depend on one another. So you have to, to test everything before you do anything. So just to make sure that it's, it's no circular references. Um, so yeah, one place where it's easy to end up with a circular reference is when we have a multiple source of truths. We have the same thing that we are updating over and over again. 
this could be having its kind of uh, um, circular references. Um, yeah, and just guide us a couple of exercises. Now, I'm trying to see if it's have anything that to do with, okay, I simply use the rest. Okay. Okay. Now we could call, talk about the dynamic visibility. So to show and high parts in the UI, um, normally we will use like JavaScript and do some stuff customly with JavaScript. But since we don't want to rely on other um, like share party or something that doesn't have related to Shiny, since we are, of course, our use case, more most useful use case is a data scientist that uses this in his education or in his um, job work for a company, for example. Um, we don't want it to like make it rely on something like JavaScript. Therefore, we have this kind of solutions that do this for you, for you if you want to, to simulate this kind of interaction. So a table set panel is the second function for this chapter and it involves the visibility of a uh, of part of the app. So this second function is made to let the user show or hide some of the tab sets in the main panel. Uh, it is a technique that uh, allows managing the appearance of the app with selecting visibility of the tabs as shown in the tab set section of uh, shinyrstudio.com. Um, Let's see it. I don't know if it's they change it yet or not. Yeah, I think it's changed it. Um, but let's go to the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We don't see the the examples. Let's go to the book again. Um, so this is the example. We are, let's see it, the app, this is the app itself. Um, this, these are the dynamic panels. You see here's the content. Um, let's Okay, so this is a panel one content. We could hide other one, like we said that only show uh, the panel one and hide the others. So two, hide the others, three, or hide the others and hide the others. So that's, that's basically the code, what, what is done in the code. And if you go to the, the app here, the code itself, you will see that, uh, Basically, uh, the, we have we have a switcher which is in the tab in the tab set panel, and we have a show is a sidebar which is select the input uh, uh, as an input to select the what what has been selected. Um, so yeah, uh, this switcher it's uh, we're just doing a, like updates using the update function again here uh, to select what has been hide and what has been. Uh, what has been what should be showed and what should be hidden. Um, so yeah, we observe the controller, which is uh, this one, this input. Uh, if we stir, if we choose like panel one, now we could like select uh, uh, select the, the, the panel one uh, input controller, which is this one. Oh yeah, it's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. The input the tiles banner itself is called switcher, yes. And the selected one is the one that we are selected from this input. So okay, yeah. Um so that's how we could hide or show a tab uh, tab tab panel set. But uh there is others other stuff that we could use. So there's something called conditional UI where we use an expression or a set of like um, logical uh, way of doing things, uh, like a logical or a conditional stuff to show or hide based on them. So in this one, 
let's see the full example. This is a conditional one. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so again, we're creating these dependencies and all uh, all the histograms uh, based on this uh, 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 drop down, the select input. So what is what has been happening? What has been done is uh, let's go to the code first. See the code. So we have we we are we just defining these parameter tabs and giving it all uh, all of this inputs uh, like an ID and the type and um, so this is what should be hidden by, by default. Uh, so that's why the type isn't hidden here. And we provide it with the tab panels with all our uh, selections. So this is the parameter tabs and we input we make it an, as an input in uh, our UI. So basically we, we intrigued it or injected in our UI uh, using like like this. Okay. So the choices is in this select first select one is this normal, uniform, and exponential distributions uh, to choose from. And also we have a numeric input that depend uh, like very depend on uh, the number of samples or create the number of sample and we have this numeric um, like stuff that related to the distribution itself. Here we have the means uh, standard deviation. We have here uh, in uniform form the minimum maximum, and here we have the rate in the exponential distribution. Um, so when we see the app itself, we when we change anything like from the number of sample, it changes the distribution, but it's saying it's still normal. Uh, but with mean and one, mean one and standard deviation is one. Uh, if we change the uniform, now we change the type of inputs that we have. So we have we basically we are selecting tabs, and each tab have a set of UI under it. So uh, the if you see this, this is a tab one tab or tab panel first tab panel and. Uh, second and third, every one of them have a, a, a set of UI that under it. So when we, we make, we make it like a conditional, if you uh, uh, choose one of them, just show it and um, um, uh, hide others, hide the others um, with, when you're doing the process. Um, so yeah, this is basically it. You, you just, uh, and of course, hide, uh, when, we ch when we choose the exponential, for example, we have here, uh, it changed to rate. When you change the uniform, it changed to minimum maximum. And in normal, we have a minimum standard deviation. Th these two things are, uh, are the things that uh, uh, like static, and the other is dynamic based on the status set uh, conditioning, uh, UI conditioning. Uh, condition UI, sorry. And yeah, this is actually very useful. I use this in work actually in Python um, with an expression that we see that is it, if it's true, do say do something, and if it's false, do others. Um, yeah, and the same way uh, as we're doing here, we when we use Python, it's the same thing. Um, I think it's called the conditional UI also as well uh, in Python. So we could so, take a look on it after we finish like playing around with uh, these examples. I um, think it's a conditional panel. Yeah, conditional panel in Python, yeah, yeah. I, I think um, Shiny R also has conditional panel, but it's a different one. It's oh, the new, the new one is the new uh, API uh, called like think... that? Now I think it's it's part of the older API, but it's uh, called conditional panel. Is it part of what? It is part of the shiny, uh, shiny package. Uh, but yeah. I think it is called as conditional panel. I remember I used it once. Okay. <clears throat> so. 
so let's see. Um, where is it? I didn't. I think this one. I don't remember, but where is it? Where is it exactly? Let's see in the search conditional. Yeah, it's done. Yeah, I'm sharing the link in the chat. Okay, let's go. Yeah, yeah, it's the same one. Oh yeah, so here we. So this one is different, I think, uh, than he talked what, what he talked about. Okay. This one is based on the a condition, which is a JavaScript expression. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's what I used in actually Python as well. Um, but he here is not talking about it. I think he talked about um, a simpler way of this because this, this is this should be a like an expression value, so it should be true or false. Mm. Uh, based on JavaScript, and oh, it evaluated, yeah, it evaluated repeatedly to determine whether the panel should be displayed or not, based on this value uh, or this condition. So interesting. I, I think there is an example here. Yeah, interesting. So you see, this is scatter. Oh yeah, yeah, I see it now. It's based on the conditional, and this is a condition, and it's uh, it give it like um, this is like a JavaScript expression, which is input dot the name of the output the the input itself which is plot type equal equal uh, his, and this is evaluated by JavaScript, uh, and the the value of it if it's true it will display it if it's false uh, it will display the other thing. So it will display this if it's true, I think. And if it only shows this if the custom is selected. Um, yeah. Yo, oh, yeah. It will display, not show. It, it, it will display if uh, if this is true. If it, it, if it false, it will just hit, be hidden. Yeah, that's it. How we could use this conditional panel? It's the same thing, but different way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, let's go back. So, yeah, this is a conditional one. I think we already discussed this. Yeah, based on the input, we change the type of parameter or the panel based on this selector. Select input. Okay, now there is a wizard interface. What's, it, what's called this wizard interface? You can also use this idea. Let's go back to the slides. Uh, okay. Uh, this is a switcher. We talked about this switch page. Yes, we talk about more about functions. Okay. Okay. Now, creating UI with code. Create and modify the user interface. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add one example in the uh, tabs that panel. Um, sure. Uh, Is it like so, in the book? Uh, it's not in the book, but uh, can I quickly share my screen? Yeah, yeah. Sure. I will um, stop sharing. Thank you. So here you see, uh, this is a tab set panel where uh, there are two parts of the app. One is the authentication part and the second is the main uh, section of the app. So uh, within one uh, panel body, we have the authentication part where we have two inputs. And then once you log in and you can use any logic, any database for authenticating your user. So after you log in, then it switches to the other tab, which is the full app. So this way you can also use the tab set panel 
to hide the app uh, before the user authenticates. Interesting. I, and this is good. This is the way we replace the routering, right? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, but so I think you could do it this in routing, right? So, yeah, because in our, uh, I yeah, don't we don't have this. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we try to simulate the interaction like routing. Yeah. Um, yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing. Okay, let's share my screen again. Okay. Um, yeah, different way of using it. Here we just doing a switch page, which is switching between pages, like pagination. Could use this for pagination, of course. Um, interesting, yeah, like ideas. We could come up with with step set panel. Uh, okay, let's go back to creating UI with code. So create and modify user interface while the app is running. So basically, with what it said is that we have a UI and a render UI. Uh, the last two functions, UI and render UI, are for applying the technique for rendering the UI by setting the value of the new input to the current value of the existing control. Uh, this technique gives the developer to, uh, the ability to create and modify the user interface while the app is running. So actually dynamic, again, dynamic UI, the like changes um, when the app is running. And as well, also it's the same as this using the updates, but uh, here we are creating a full UI and render it, render it based on the something or make it like an automated way, an automated way how you could render uh, a specific set of UIs. So it could be a fluid page under a fluid page under a fluid page. That's how we could, again, we could use this as a module again, but we, we, we don't talk about module yet, but basically uh, it will do like, the heavy part of uh, modularity, creating this modul modular, um, like smaller shiny apps, but or smaller pages or smaller functionalities, uh, and separate it, separate it, show its logic from in, in the app. And yeah, it could be a, a big shiny app with smaller ones inside it and interacting between modules and uh, showing what module to show and what module to, to hide and other stuff we could talk about when it, when we reach to the module chapter but actually it's a very good uh, practice and it's always like recommended to like a lot of um, a lot of like our developers are uh, recommending that we go through the chapter first the first chapter we got read about uh, in, in the Mastering Shiny is the Shiny module chapter uh, because it, it, re it actually, we could use it everywhere. Like we could use it in the dynamic UI. We could use it in fe user feedback, in the reactivity, in no workflow. So like modules are the stuff that, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the same as the Shiny app, but when, we, when you like study it from the beginning or read it about in the beginning, uh, you could like make it as, as your best practice and your uh, favorable way of doing things. Uh, that's why that we are. That's why uh, a lot of people included like uh, Hedley Wickham, which is a uh, the um, uh, the author of the book, that really recommending that we read the chapter uh, Shiny modules first, then go through the Mastering Shiny uh, book from the beginning to the end. Um, but yeah, we we just started like sequentially, so uh, we could talk more about uh, modules later. But it's actually a very good practice. Um, yeah, so this technique gives the developers the ability to create and modify the user interface while the app is running. So UI output, which is the output function for the UI, act is uh, in the UI part of the app, while render UI is act in the server part. 
uh, in this context, uh, let's go to the book, see, uh, okay, this is the UI output, and <clears throat> this is a render UI. Let's see, okay, you see here, we have this UI output called numeric, uh, where that depends on this output, uh, which is numeric output. We say that it's a render UI, and we make it like uh, if the input type uh, equals slider, we're referring to this select input. If it's slider, then display this. Uh, otherwise, or else display this dynamic. Um, so let's try it, see it live. Okay, now this is dependent on this one. Okay, let's try what I'm saying. Um, so this is a slider. Since we are we 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 select the slider, if we change to numeric, it will become numeric. And that's how by using just the render UI function, uh, we uh, and we could use it at, in more complex way. I think he will talk more here about it. For example, he's, he, he talked about multiple control here. Let's go to here. Whereas he's talking about, uh, in this context, the isolate would be able to do this, isolating a particular input. Find an example to show position of two functions inside the UI. And, uh, I don't think this is like, let's go to the book. So dynamic UI is most part useful when you are generating an arbitrary number or type of controls. That means that you will be generating UI with code. And I recommend, yeah, you recommend here that using functional programming for, for this sort of task. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, I think people that use like R is, is heavily use, heavily using the per function or pure per, per package to uh, to do this kind of functional programming uh, not uh, I don't know uh, if it's uh, if the new updates uh, like the last updates for uh, for the R language is on including including this functionality or not yet but it's built uh, in Python uh, like built in it's, it, it exists built in in the language so that's why uh, it's weird. It's a little bit weird to have it in a package because it's, because it R R it doesn't design it. It's not designed to be this uh, the functional programming language. So that's why <coughs> that's why it, uh, it's really uh, it's doing this kind of uh, like uh, creating this kind of packages to simulate this kind of uh, way of programming. Uh, yeah, we could same do the same thing. It'll apply or reduce functions that in, uh, exist in the R language. Yeah, I guess that oh. that basically answers that that point that uh, R does support functional programming. In the example here, uh, Hadley used uh, per map, but you can also use L apply for the same, and L apply is part of R base R. Yeah. So actually, yeah, it answers this. Yeah, I tried to just uh, compare it to Python uh, right away since I used to Python. So but actually, I are having like um, its own uh, realm of our, our own way of doing things, like Python, of course, having its own way to doing things or multiple ways, again. It depends on the language itself and how you could use it. Um, so yeah, uh, we will come back to this idea in chapter 18. We talk about functional programming in chapter 18, this one. Um, do you first specify how many colors uh, does he have? Yeah, let's see it. Okay. Okay, 
through the code to have UI output and text output. You have the reactive. Yeah. This output, you should render this kind of stuff based on, yeah, the, 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 the value of uh, text out input. Okay. That's interesting. Let's see, see it in action. I don't think it's, there is a colors. Um, should I write? Yeah, in the later example, you will be able to see the color palette also. Right now, if you only enter the color names, it will just show the Oh, color yeah, yeah. So, oh yeah, this one, yeah. Okay, interesting. It's still like doesn't show the colors. So should I enter the name it? Yeah. yeah. So I, I should like like label all of them and it will show uh the color based on the labeling. And the code for that is interesting as uh we are using this kind of way of uh, UI input or and render functions to do this placing or injecting stuff in the UI be based on this function map, uh, map function, which is mapping every column name to uh, its correspondence, correspondent uh, value of input. Um, yeah. So in Python, yeah. what would you use uh, compared to map here? We have a map function as well, oh. uh, so it's the same, yeah. Um, because it, like the mapping again, the, well, it's the same. Like we have the same principles in function programming. So translating is just like uh, syntax difference, but uh, in in Python it's the same. I think so. We we don't have even uh, syntax differences, uh, and we have reduce all as well and other stuff. Um, yeah. So to finish off this chapter, I'm going to create, let's see if it's, uh, if there's something in the slides that, or it's finish, finishes with that. Yeah, we, not, nothing in the chapter. Let's go to the dynamic filtering, I think. Uh, let's you dynamically filter any, any data frame. Yeah, uh, we talked about the filtering itself again. So each numeric variable will get a range of slider and each factor variable will get a multi-select. So if your data frame has a three numeric variables and two factors, the app will have three sliders and two select boxes. Interesting. So we are creating like a logical way of using, of doing, of creating UI. So if it's numeric, uh, create this UI. If it's factor, create this UI based on what has been selected as an X. So is it, if it's X is like um, a column of a numeric column, uh, create this. If it's uh, so, yeah, this is creating a function as a um, as a small chunk that we are using everywhere. So you see here that we will use it, uh, what's called make UI. Yeah, we will use this make UI function uh, in here. Where is it? I don't see it. <coughs> Excuse me. Server equivalent. Okay, yeah, make UI is here. Okay, so we just pass the variable and the uh, its corresponding name. I think it's a label, right? Yeah, it's label. So this is a label and this is a variable here. And if we go back and see the uh, select input, again, this is the, uh, the value and the label of it. And yeah, we created levels and created range based on the X again. 
uh, so yeah, we created like based on the selection, uh, doing do this logic where if if else if and else, um, to create a UI based like conditional way of using of creating UI. This is actually like how we, I could summarize it, um, which is awesome because. Uh, a lot of stuff happening. Let's go, let's see the, the example. Uh, I think there is a link. Yeah, this one. So creating this kind of uh, conditional way of displaying stuff is very powerful since if you will create a really big dashboard or a really like lo uh, big app. Uh, the dependent have, have a lot of dependencies and have a lot of reactive graphs. So, for example, this if for this iris data set, where is it? We have a spatial length and spile width, on petal length and petal width and species. And since all those are um, numeric, it's become a slider. And so, since those are the factor, it's becoming this one has become as like as a a selector, a select input, uh, or multi-select input, I think. Um, let's see the code. Yeah. Yeah. Multiple true, yeah. So make it multiple true, we see that this in here. So yeah, we create we're creating this this UI based on the data set it's or, or in the column name. Here we have like four ones and yeah. The others you see we have a subject time and going. All of them are um so the sub subject one is uh is actually a factor, is not like a numeric. So like again, based on the type of it. We are displaying uh, a different type of UI, which actually, which actually is interesting. Yeah, and what else we have? Let's go back and see. Yeah, I think this is it. But I think here is the, we have the dialog box. Do we have an example of it? Yeah, it's the same one. Actually, this is a way of doing like a, a model um to show password and creating passwords and like creating a login page for example they are using the here the model to show the password and display stuff for the user uh, as we discussed in the user feedback we we discuss about the model and how we could use it to create stuff um, and interact so yeah <coughs> this is a way of uh, create of using this kind of uh, creating UI with code, using the UI output and render UI. So yeah, do you have any comments uh, about that? I think this chapter will have a, lo a, lot of, a lot of examples and a lot of uh, creative way of, uh, uh, creative, very creative way of, cre of using this kind of dynamic UI uh, overview for us to, like creating very complex UI uh, based on, on conditions, based on uh, hierarchical select selections, based on uh, uh, um, actives uh, or um, an updates, we automating stuff. When we automate stuff based on the input, we want to update the input itself to automate the reactive that depend on the input and, and so on and so forth. So it has a lot of value. This chapter is very use, useful. I think it's more useful than um, than the the last chapter. Um, yeah. And the, the, anyone have any comment? Shall we end this? All good. Awesome. So, I think not. No one is signed for the bookmarking chapter. This is uh, chapter eleven. Um, I, I volunteer for it. Sure, sure, awesome. So I will take. I I think I take like uh twelve 
and 13, 14, and 15. Uh, actually, I, I really intri like interested in reactivity itself, uh, as it is in Python as well. So I will try also to display it or uh, in Python how it's how this is working uh, when we dive deeper into reactivity. So that's why I uh, I, I I really interested in it. Um, so yeah, I see you guys later and uh, have a good day. Um, we will meet next uh, in the next session to discuss the bookmarking chapter. And thank you for listening and. Uh, See you later. Thank you, Amir. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys.